a lot of the people who were around in 2009 are gone. A lot of the people who were around in 2013 are gone. Like a lot of the biggest names from 2015, not even in the industry anymore. And, and so you wonder like, what happened? Did they give up? Were they really not in it to begin with? Were they just in it for a quick buck? You know, a lot of people worry about like, oh, it's just getting more competitive. You know what? The tools are getting a million times better. The opportunities are getting a million times better. And a lot of people quit. Like that's just the reality. Like just, just like keep going. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 169 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have an interview with Monica Lionel, a USA Today bestselling author, best known for her young adult urban fantasy and paranormal romance series, Waters Dark and Deep. She also teaches writing, publishing, business, and marketing at theworldneedsyourbook.com. Monica's most recent nonfiction series, Growth Hacking for Storytellers, has helped thousands of writers write faster, become better storytellers, and find their way to success. It's a fascinating conversation with Monica. It was great to catch up with her, and that's coming up later in the episode. But first, I wanted to share some personal updates, comments, etc. in the pre-matter for this episode. Let's jump into the first thing that I've been thinking a lot about. It was announced this week that Robin Cutler has joined LMBPN Publishing. Now, I'm going to explain LMBPN Publishing and Robin Cutler for anyone who's not familiar. Now, Robin Cutler was the head of Ingram Spark most recently. She recently retired. She has a long career in the book publishing industry. She, I'm not going to go to when she started out, but one of the more recent things she's done in the last, let's say, 10 or 12 or 15 years is starting the publishing imprint Summerhouse Press. She was also a vendor manager at CreateSpace, and CreateSpace got absorbed, bought by and absorbed into KDP Print, but it was a a powerhouse on its own that then eventually got bought by Amazon, etc. And then most recently, Robin was the head of Ingram Spark before she retired. Now, she's just joined LMBPN Publishing uh, as the... um, uh, CEO, one of the one of the three head figures of LMBPM Publishing. Now, what is LMBPM Publishing, and why am I excited uh, about this acquisition? Well, LMBPN Publishing is a publishing company created by uh, Michael and Judith Onderley. If you're not familiar with Michael and Judith, uh, Michael Onderley is the person behind the twenty books to fifty k movement. Years ago. Michael was uh, an independent author who was publishing his books, and he took a look at the average uh, units he was selling uh, of a particular book and how much he was earning in, in a month. And he was looking at what it would take to earn $50,000 a year, assuming all his books sold at that rate. And he calculated, if he did all the right things, that if he wrote, 20 books and published 20 books, he would earn enough money to earn about $50,000 a year, which would have let uh, him and Judith uh, live a comfortable uh, existence. I think they were in Cabo at the time. So uh, the costs of living were relatively decent and they could make it, you know, make have a decent life. Well, not only did it work well for him, but I think it was, it wasn't even a year uh, before Michael cracked the 50K and, and moved on. He also, uh, had uh, been thinking that he was going to, one of the strategies he's employed is he called it to Patterson the shit out of his writing career, which means uh, collaborating and and co-authoring with a whole bunch of people, like taking the brand that he'd started off under the Michael Onderley brand and then working with other authors um, and, and actually helping other authors get 
uh, foothold in the industry because they may not have had a following, but people were following the Michael Anderle brand. So that allowed Michael to get more books out because he was splitting the work with uh, so many other people. And, and out of this, out of all of this collaborative publishing, out of all this dynamic and adept publishing, came LMBPN Publishing, which uh, is, is actually, uh, the, the term uh, stands for uh, the uh, fashion capitals uh, of the world, uh, London, Madrid, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on uh, 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 B, <laughs> some P in New York, Paris and New York. Um, so these are the... Uh, uh, the public, the, the, not publishing, but the um, uh, the fashion uh, centers uh, of the world, and they thought that was a neat name. They designed a logo, and they've been publishing hundreds of books uh, a year, working collaboratively with so many authors, and actually giving indie authors, uh, although they are a traditional publishers, so they're publishing the books, they're getting the money, and then they're paying the authors, right? So the they are a traditional publisher in that sense, but they're indie authors, and they're indie publishers in the sense that they're publishing dynamically and quickly, and rapid releasing, and series books, and all of these amazing things. So... Uh, I've worked uh, with them, I've known them uh, for a long time, and was collaborating with them when they were doing, they, they were mostly publishing um, exclusive to Kindle, but I remember, uh, you know, seeing Judith and Michael at Book Expo America years ago, and introducing them to some of the really cool people uh, there from the traditional side of things, like Publishers Weekly and Ingram and a whole bunch of other uh, places, because they were looking at, like, they, they conquered digital, and they were looking at how to get into the other side of uh, of publishing, which is the old boys, uh, you know, uh, warehousing and distribution and all that, and and so they've been experimenting with publishing wide, uh, and, and in the last year they they launched a massive uh, new science fiction series program that was done collaboratively with virtually every major ebook retailer was involved, uh, and uh, distributors. Uh, so you know, Draft to Digital and Publish Drive were heavily involved in helping promote this um, uh, this this new series. Uh, they had uh, video trailers, all kinds of really amazing stuff going on, and it's just been a dynamic book launch. And they and they recognize that it's a long, slow build, but they've just been working hard and building the, these brands and continually experimenting and publishing, which I think is 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 what makes publishing so exciting. Is when these players can come in and 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 start pushing the envelope and doing new things. So imagine combining the brilliance and creativity that Judith and Michael Anderle have put into LMBPN Publishing. And I should also say they are the heads of LMBPN Publishing, but there's a really amazing team behind them. Uh, they have full-time people that work for them, like Steve and a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of other people. I can't even name them all. There's so many. And then on top of that, there's hundreds of writers that are part of that, uh, and, and many writers who got their start in those collaborations. So you combine that, that dynamic energy and the knowledge and skill of digital publishing, and you take someone like Robin Cutler, who really knows book distribution in, uh, in the traditional sense, and she understands it like intimately, and obviously has a significant amount of print uh, and trade uh, market expertise. You combine those forces, and LMBPN Publishing is, uh, in my mind, is going to soon be one of the, you know, there used to be when I started in publishing like the top 10, the top 12 publishers. They're now down to four as, as Simon & Schuster gets absorbed into Penguin Random House um, as, as I'm recording this. Um, but I think LMBPN Publishing is going to be, you know, among those top 10 publishers when you think about the might that they have. Now, when I was at Kobo, Kobo Writing Life, which was just the self-published titles through Kobo, if you considered Kobo Writing Life a publishing imprint, Kobo Writing Life uh, was uh, one in every four books sold on Kobo was coming from that. Now, that didn't include Smashwords and Draft to Digital and Publish Drive and, and Street Lib and any of those other uh, digital aggregators. So, so self-published books were actually probably a lot more than one in every four books sold on Kobo. Which, And if it's happening at Kobo, it's probably what's happening at Amazon and all the other places. But... I think LMBPN publishing with their might and their speed of publishing and all the adept things that they're doing could very easily be in the top 10 uh, of the publishers uh, in, in the digital uh, marketing space. And obviously, with what Robin's going to do with them, probably some inroads into print, uh, which is sort of a foreign territory for most indie authors. So I'm harping on that for a while, but I think that's critical and I think it's important for us to understand 
I, I'm talking about that. I did share uh, for my patrons just recently about a, a 15 minute or so, it might have been a little bit longer, um, detailed look at what I thought of uh, publishing trends for the uh, for the future. And I, I was asked by the good folks at Written Word Media, these are the, the geniuses behind Bargain Booksy and Free Booksy, uh, etc., and a whole bunch of other marketing uh, platforms. Uh, and they'd asked me if I would share my thoughts on publishing trends and predictions. And so what I did is I, I just, you know, took out a you know, Word document and I just started hammering out my thoughts. And, and I created like really long document <laughs> and realized they only wanted about 500 words. So I kind of, I, p- I picked and choose and I took a few things and I sent it to them uh, for that article, which I think is supposed to be coming out um, the week of the, the 28th of uh, December, sort of end of year. Uh, wrap up and look forward. But I thought, uh, what I did is I, I thought, well, for my patrons, I'm just going to give you the full unabridged <laughs> version. Um, and, and that was uh, something uh, that was really, really cool. And that's going to lead to the comments. See how I did that segue? Uh, so I published that, uh, would have been, I'm recording this on the 24th of December, so would have been the 23rd that I published that. And, and a lot of comments about that. And I think because the comments are going to allow me to talk a little bit about those publishing trends, I'm going to do a little bumper thingy and then talk about comments. So for comments, and these comments come from patrons over at patreon.com slash starkreflections, Connor Whiteley says, Thanks for this, Mark. This just reminds me of why I started The Global Author, because I want authors to understand this. There are millions of readers in faraway countries that are only coming online now or in the next few decades. And authors can take advantage of this if our books, in all formats, are available to them. Thanks for that comment, uh, Connor. Yeah, so true. I'm so glad that you've got the global author out there and you're helping authors understand this because we, again, we only think of the US, we only think of the UK. And again, we're still only thinking about ebooks in a lot of cases. So as you say, there's a lot of different formats and there's a lot of different um, opportunities for writers. Uh, and, and again, because I'm, I'm a publishing wide uh, advocate, uh, I'm thinking that exploiting those IPs and uh, extending them way beyond just Kindle uh, is is and just eBooks, for example, is is a great way to go. So thanks for that, uh, Connor. Now Sherry Dector Hurst, writing as Sherilyn Dector, uh, comments on that as well and says, "Is an indie writer publisher who yearns for a bit of." boring predictability. (laughs) Tell me about it. Um, Especially after the past year. I was taken aback to hear we're not even halfway through the innovation cycle. Ah, well, adaptability, thy name is self-published. Love that comment, Sherry. Love, uh, love that you did that. Um, yeah, and and that's the reality, right? Like we think of the the golden days uh, of or the gold rush days. You know, the Kindle Gold Rush, two thousand nine to two thousand and twelve. Um, but the reality is, most people still have not read uh, an ebook. But the reality is, most readers are still reading print books. I'm going to get to that in the next comment. <laughs> Uh, so Stanley B. Trice also comments and uh, says, thanks for your insight, Mark. Maybe the world will be more online in the future. However, I still enjoy holding a book in my hands, even if it is simpler to go ebook. Uh, and thank you for that comment, Stanley, because you're like, you know, 60 to 70, uh, perhaps upwards to 80% of people uh, who, um, you know, in the last couple of years uh, still haven't read an ebook. Now that changed uh, dramatically. Now I, I get into that uh, again in that patron episode, so I'm not going to repeat that to put all the patrons to sleep. But in a nutshell, most people still haven't read an ebook. Yes, that's changed this year with uh, the advent of, of, of COVID-19 and the lockdown and bookstores closing and you can get easily get digital books online, you can get them through your local library, etc. But it was really, really difficult to get print books. So ebook adoption rates went up significantly, uh, but they're still not um, anywhere uh, near close to where they need to go. Uh, the other thing I should say uh, is when I'm talking about e- ebook adoption only being, let's say, 30% of the market roughly uh, right now, that that's going to still grow. We're still pretty much halfway uh, there because estimations and experts in the industry kind of say that uh, it probably ebooks will never get to 50%, beyond 50 or 60% of the market. Uh, print books will still be there and still be dominant. Now, here's a few reasons why print books will, will remain dominant. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's such a nice gift to give. It's a nicer gift in many ways um, because you can inscribe it and all kinds of things like that. So a lot of people who read ebooks may buy print books as gifts. And this goes back to something I learned at Kobo. Kobo had done a study and, and found that people who read ebooks buy twice as many print books as they used to when they only read print books. 
And that's usually because they read an ebook and they want it because they either want to mark it up or put it on their shelves. Because sometimes for easy reference, you pick it and you thumb through it um, to find a passage. It's harder to do that, ironically, in a, uh, the, the way the ebook uh, devices work right now. Uh, or to buy them as a gift. Um, because maybe you're buying them for a friend and it's nice to give it as a gift or maybe the friend doesn't read on ebooks and it's kind of it is challenging uh, to buy gifts uh, ebook gifts even on the different platforms I was looking at it recently and it's it's frustrating it's easier to just buy a print book and <laughs> give it to someone um, and of course um, and, and there, there's something that comes with print like there's the whole feel like it's it's like the vinyl movement uh, in music that's still very very much dominant for uh, audio files. And, and bibliophiles do have that because there is something magical uh, about what happens to that ink on uh, dead trees that uh, we, we feel so passionate about. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I use the books in, in my office here almost partially as uh, insulation, not just from the outside elements, but also for recording audio because it reduces the echo. <laughs> so not only are they beautiful and I love them to death, but um, they provide multiple. So 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 uh, ebooks will continue to grow. Uh, that's the important thing to think about that we're not uh, we haven't saturated the market, and that's that's basically the gist uh, of of the details. So that's just uh, I guess some comments from recent episodes. You can comment on episodes over at StarkReflections.ca for any episode, or you can at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. Now let's hear from this episode's sponsors. Sponsors? Yeah, that's right. Sponsors. There's two of them. The first sponsor for this episode is Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a way that authors can get their audiobook out into the largest retail and library audiobook market available. If you are looking for a narrator, you can use Findaway Voices to find a professional narrator. And it's not a DIY process. They actually assign knowledgeable, industry knowledgeable project managers to your project to find you the best narrator based on the RFP that you put in about your book, based on that narrator's experience and even some of the, the voices or uh, dialects or anything that you're specifically looking for. Great opportunity for you if you're not sure what you're doing to be guided through this process. Or if you already have a professional audiobook ready to go, you can use Findaway Voices for free to get your book out into that market. You distribute it, set your own price. There's promotional opportunities available as well. And if you want to learn how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. This episode is also brought to you by the holiday stock up sale from Story Stuck Coaching from Clark Chamberlain. Sometimes all you need for your writing project is a second set of eyes on the problem where you're stuck. So no more second guessing. The inner editor is not your friend. And with Story Stuck Coaching, you can turn that voice off and trust your story is the best it can be. Now, Clark Chamberlain has helped hundreds of authors with ironclad outlines, manuscript evaluation, and story stuck coaching. And if you're listening to this before the end of 2020, there's a limited time offer available over at authorhustle.com slash stockup. You can get access to story stuck coaching for $75, which is actually worth more than uh, $220. Ironclad outline. Uh, for $250, and the regular price for that is just under $800, or a full manuscript evaluation for $1,000, and the regular price for that is more than $2,700. This is a significant discount where you can save huge to make 2021 your best writing year ever. Now, special offer for patrons of this podcast is... I have already purchased a Story Stuck coaching package from Clark, and this was regularly uh, $229. I managed to get it for $75 because I wanted to take advantage of this. But what you get is you'll get an hour-long one-on-one call with Clark, and you'll get 30 days of Story Stage work. And there's details about that over at authorhustle.com slash stuckup. And if you're a patron of the show, you're going to be automatically entered in an opportunity to win a story stuck coaching. And I'll let patrons know who the winner is 
on uh, the. I guess I can't do it for the thirty first December thirty first episode because I want to leave to, you know leave that to the end of the month. But it will be the episode in the first week of January twenty twenty one. Of course, you don't have to be a patron of this podcast to take advantage of this. You can get yourself on over to authorhustle.com slash stockup before the end of day, December 31st, to take advantage of this great savings from an amazing mentor. For my personal update, I have been doing, uh, back into videos again, back into uh, doing some video productions. I'm putting together some more courses uh, for Teachable. Uh, which I've actually been making some headway on, uh, thanks to a mastermind I'm part of, and they've been helping me and prompting me along as I suffer through in my uh, in my procrastinator ways. But one of the things that I produced in video this week and I wanted to share, because I think it's kind of important, is uh, Robert Jashonik uh, was putting together an anthology called Space 1975. I've spoke about it way back when... Um, because uh, he had asked me to write a science fiction story with a sort of 70s feel or 70s vibe to it, uh, which I did and, and just made it in time uh, for the deadline. But one of the things is a bunch of the contributors, um, because he was doing it as a Kickstarter, a bunch of the writers who were signed up to do this, um, uh, there, there's a, a, a digital um, treasure chest bundle of all kinds of archives from digital. And um, Robert had asked, uh, or some of us had volunteered, uh, to put together some stuff. So I have, you know, um, uh, screenshots, or s- screenshots, uh, photographs of my uh, writing journal, early writing journal, like my very first published sale. And you can see my scrawling from, you know, the late 80s, early 90s of the rejections I got and the acceptances. And so I've got pictures of that, pictures of my very first published horror story, you know, where it got, where it got listed in the year's best fantasy and horror. And and I thought it would be fun because it's science fiction-y um, is to take uh, people back on a journey to the early, early Mark Leslie storytelling days. And uh, it goes back to high school when my best friend John Ellis and I had uh, got together. I would used my Conan the Barbarian costume, uh, and, and I was called Conehead the Barbarian. And, and uh, I had had a, a death costume, which was basically this big robe cloak and and he wore the cloak um without the death face and stuff and, and he was my strony the magician and we'd team up and go on these really stupid pointless adventures which are just going into a dungeon to try to find this magical amulet that these two idiots were were after and and we called it tough guys big adventures because the personas we adopted uh for for these characters were like little kids pretending to be big tough guys you know talking in big tough guy voices and and stuff and so they're they're very immature and uh, and dumb uh, but also, you know, good hearts um, and, 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 and thinking that they're big and tough guys. And it was sort of, uh, it was edited in camera on VHS video. So this, you know, way back, you know, early 80s. And when I was in uh, university or, or college, if you're in the U.S., you probably call it college or uni, uh, if you're other parts of uh, Commonwealth, <laughs> overseas, etc. The um, I, I was I was big, uh, you know, in high school, I was big into... Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and so I did a parody, Star Trek The Generation After The Next, and uh, and incorporated the tough guys into it, because there's this time travel thing that happened, so uh, John and I play all of the characters, uh, because there's no one else to act, right, <laughs> and we play all the characters and uh, did that. So that was kind of a fun thing that I put together. It's basically an explanation. Uh, I wanted to share the Star Trek thingies because I thought it was kind of goofy and fun, and gave uh, and gave uh, readers uh, insights into the twisted, bizarre mind of Mark Leslie. Uh, and that uh, that I'm putting together. If you're a patron, it's just sort of a I'm going to be releasing that on uh, Christmas Day so that patrons can can either bore themselves uh, or or roll their eyes and laugh at me. Uh, and, and that was a fun thing I did. And I thought it was it was interesting. The reason I'm sharing it here in my personal update is because I spent quite a bit of time digging into some archives and looking at those early rejections and acceptances. And in my notes, my unabridged, like, this is what I wrote, um, which is kind of neat. Um, I think, uh, I, and I forgot to share, but there was a note of uh, to Ellen Datlow when I'd sent Ellen Datlow um, my very first published horror story. And uh, and got a note back saying, uh, and it said like, I made I made the rec list for the year, and I and I had no idea what her rec list was the year, not realizing that it was you know I, I made the recommended or honorable mentions in the year's best fantasy and horror. Now I didn't get you know uh, a story republished there, but 
I made the rec list and it was so cute that I had no idea what it was. And, and it's, it's one of the most significant honors uh, for me as a horror writer, uh, that kind of recognition from such an esteemed editor as uh, Ellen Datlow. But it was, kind of, it was kind of interesting for me to go down that memory lane. And so that's why I did that uh, video that's, um, I guess, available through uh, for the backers of that particular Kickstarter project. Now, um, I'm sharing that again for patrons uh, as well, but I thought uh, for everyone, uh, since I've, I've already bored you with this, is I did another short dad joke video. And I did this one Christmas themed. And, and I just released it um, on the 23rd. And it was basically, it's a dad joke um, involving uh, the Christmas Carol. And, and, the, and the short video, which I think is a, a minute and 30 seconds, it's really a 10 second joke, but it's the credits at the beginning and the theme music from the awesome Kevin McLeod, who does the audio uh, for this podcast. Um, and uh, and it's just like a stupid uh, short video, uh, dad joke video. But um, that's available on YouTube, and I'll post a link to that in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca in case you feel like a little bit of eye-rolling Christmas themed humor. Well, that's it for my way too long introduction to this episode. We're almost approaching half an hour. Are you still listening? Maybe you've just been skipping forward because you want to get to this awesome interview with Monica Lionel. So I've, I've, I've put enough adieu here. I was going to say without further ado, but there's been way too much ado. But anyways, uh, let's skip, uh, skip forward to <laughs> this fascinating conversation with Monica. Monica, so glad that you can be here with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to get started. First of all, let's go back to the beginning of, of you as a creative person, as a writer. Where where did it all begin for Monica? Well, I started in self-publishing in 2009 before Kindle wow, um, that's Direct Publishing days. even existed. Yeah, it was like the print-on-demand days. And um, I did start in nonfiction, so that was a little bit easier. Um, my dream was to write fiction. Right. And I, so I started, so I did the nonfiction first. It was a book toward corporations about social media. And this was kind of like when Twitter was starting. Wow. Um, so yeah, I, when Twitter was still like cell yeah. phone, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I, I was one of not, not one of the first people on Twitter, but I was on Twitter before celebrities got on Twitter. Okay. Um, and I, you know, so I was, wait I, a minute, you are a celebrity. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. A celebrity. Um, yeah. So it, that book, uh, it basically helped me change careers. So I became, so I, I became like well known for um, wow. understanding social media marketing for corporations, and I was able to use my book as more of like a business card, uh, and switch shifted from software engineering uh, to social media marketing. So I was, you know, I was like a marketing director so, at multiple companies. That's fantastic. So this yeah. was, this book was a, a print on demand book, probably. Um, it was, yeah, it was print on demand. It's, this is before it's not Ingram a good Spark. book. <laughs> Do you have to um, navigate? It was yeah, I had light, yeah, lightning. Yeah. I, so you... I was on lightning source. I was <laughs> reading like, yeah, there were a couple of big blogs at the time. Um, I remember I also bought the domain, um, how, or I wanted to buy the domain, how to be an author. And oh. Joanna, this woman named Joanna Penn had it. And I was like, oh, I never, this woman, whatever, Joanna whatever Penn. came of her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then she, she, you know, obviously we, we all know her now, but um, it was like, <laughs> she, she got my, she got my domain name. Like I was, I was all upset. And you remind um, her of this all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've told her about that. Um, yeah, so so there was like Joanna, you know, Joanna Penn was present at the time. So I was reading like all her stuff. And like, there were a couple other people who are not really, um, they're not really like in the industry anymore. But yeah, that was kind of where I got started. And then I really wanted to write fiction. And after I'd done the nonfiction process, I was like, okay, I'll do this for fiction, even though like everybody thinks that's crazy. And like, right. I, I didn't sell very many of the nonfiction just to be clear. Um, so I did start that process for fiction. And then all of a sudden, uh, Amanda Hawking came on the scene and like Kindle direct publishing and like all this cool stuff. And I was like, oh, like this, this happened at like the perfect time. Cause I had kind of finished my book around like 2011. So right. that was my first, my first foray into fiction. So what was the first fiction book for you? Well, it was a book called Silver Smoke, and it was not written to market. It was 120,000 words. It was young adult urban fantasy, um, 
and it was you know it was kind of like a it was similar to like twilight um it was shortly after twilight was popular so i've i've basically taken the book down um as, as well as the the first one the the one about social media i've taken that down as well uh, and kind of re rework the story so okay. it was it was quite a bit of story in one book so it wasn't wasn't the best thing I think it okay so it did sell like 5,000 copies not even joking but most um, people never sell 5,000 yeah, copies <laughs> it did but it was because it was um it was because of the time period not because of the quality so yeah so I had to like rework it and yeah so still actually reworking that series a bit so Wow. Uh, I, I think that's interesting because you were in early, like you were in the early days before. <laughs> I mean, so Kindle Direct Publishing was just coming out around that time. Yeah, it was. I think there was KDP, there was Kindle mm -hmm. Direct Publishing, and then there was Smashwords, and that was Yeah, it. there was Smashwords. Oh my gosh, Smashwords. Um, they're great. Like that is how you got to every other um, publisher, basically yeah. every, yeah. every other platform. Um, and so... I used Smashwords for a while. Um, I don't know if you remember, it was very hard to get your EPUB together. You're like code, you're like in the XML coding stuff. And then um, as the platforms opened up, I started getting onto all of them. So like I have, I have a, an old, you know, I, I've been on I, I, or Apple Books, sorry. I've been on Apple Books for a very long time as well. I've been on Kobo for a very long time, like pretty much like when they opened, that's that's kind of when I got on Google Play. I had that account since 20, whatever, 2014 when they opened uh, and Barnes and Noble and kind of everybody else. But yeah, it's, you know, I, I think publishing is great. Like everybody's like, oh, publishing's so hard. I'm like, oh my gosh, you were not there a decade ago. It was, it is like so much easier now. Well, that's because <laughs> back in the day, you used to have to carry your EPUB uphill both ways on your way to the office, Literally, right? In yeah. 10 feet of snow. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really hard. It was hard to format. Oh my gosh, every little thing was hard. So yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember doing a course on uh, HTML specifically to how to put an EPUB yeah. together manually yeah. in those early yeah. days. Yeah. I mean, I have a degree in computer science and I could not figure out, like I, I would go through it like multiple times. I'm just like, what is wrong with it? Like, where does it not meet the formatting standards? But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how other people did it. I was like, well, I, at least I know how to like code. Um, and then I'm like, I don't know how you would do it if you don't know how to do coding. Right. It was yeah. it was hard. <laughs> yeah, there, there weren't there weren't the the many free options uh, to to get it done. Yeah. So you said that when that book came out, it became a calling card. That 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 was like a way that you could pivot in your career. Yeah. And then what was that next major turning point for you as a as a writer? Yeah, the next major turning point was. Um, it was, uh, I basically learned how to write fast. So that's kind of the foundation of my um, productive novelist series, which is formerly Growth Hacking for Storytellers was the former title. Um, but yeah, I learned how to write fast. And I basically went from about 700 to 1200 words per hour. And I went to over um, like 3500 plus um, using a, a variety of techniques, like doing better outlining, uh, using like flow techniques. So like the Pomodoro method, which now, you know, now kind of everybody knows to use, like do like writing sprints. But at the time, this was, this was very new and like kind of cutting edge um, information because a lot right. of people were like, you know, like I've got to toil over my fiction. And like, if you write fast, it's no good. Like there was just a lot of... Um, lot of mindset stuff to move through for the collective consciousness of the authors, the author world. Um, so yeah, that was a big one. And when I did that, I, um, because I was experimenting, I wasn't really able to do it with like the, the series that I had started with. So I had a different pen name and was writing romance. And um, I wrote a, you know, I wrote a series that like kind of took off on its own and I was I was not making a ton of money I was making about a thousand dollars a month um there, there you go again. there you go yeah. again saying it's not a lot of money it's <laughs> well it, it, it was not about the who are like a thousand I'd like to make that in a year yeah 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 I mean I I but when I say by that I mean like 
it it wouldn't make that now with like zero marketing because it just oh, right yeah right. Okay. like things have like just changed so much and gotten more um just gotten com- more competitive I guess but so yeah what, so what are some of the what are some of the marketing things that seem to be like you can't you can't just put a book up and like in 2009 and expect to sell yeah. 5,000 copies what are some of the fundamental marketing strategies that authors need to say no no I need this as a baseline yeah I mean I think the most important thing is truly uh is truly writing a book that's like really ready to go from a marketing standpoint, not from a craft standpoint, though you can argue that they're kind of the same thing um, or they're becoming the same thing. But I think, um, you know, there, so there's a, there's a couple of things around that. So one is like um, writing to like those super niche readers um, who are, you know, some people call them like whale readers, uh, but they're, they're basically like the diehards, <laughs> like the right, diehard right. readers of your genre or really your subgenre. Um, so writing to those people, but then also um, writing to like the casual reader who reads maybe like 10 books a year. Mm-hmm. And then also writing to the, the un, you know, the bestseller reader, like the one who only reads like one book a year. And it's like the top seller of, of like all the categories. Um, and so writing to all of those, and it really, it comes down to like, definitely write to your small, um, your small niche tropes, but also you need to be looking at like story structure on, um, on the larger scale. And like, I think a lot of the books that are successful are like, like they kind of have a bit of everything at the high level. Like they're, they're like, there's a thriller aspect to it. There's like a romance aspect to it. And when you break down the story structure of those books, they've actually layered like all the tropes of romance is like one of the layers. And then all the tropes of mystery is another layer. And like, so you can see like they actually wrote to both genres. So like Twilight is actually Twilight by Stephanie Meyer is actually a great example of that. Like it writes, it's like, it is essentially a romance, but it also has written to like a thriller um, and, and like, uh, not really mystery, but um, yeah, it's like, it's, it's written to a couple different um, genres, um, fantasy as well. Uh, The Martian is actually like, that's, that's the example I use frequently, which is that um, and because you can see it in the book, it's like written to these super like diehard sci-fi readers, but then it's also got that really high level structure that like it became a movie and it, you know, it was like an Oscar nominated movie. And that's because the story itself is um, it like just it hits the, um, the high level story structure just so perfectly. And so that that I think is a really big part of it. <laughs> um the, the second thing would be um, using like psychological triggers. So I call them story up levels, but you know, it's, it's stuff like um, it, it, it's, it's like, uh, so like one thing in story structure, for example, is like at the center of the story, the character either needs to, to um, have their life threatened physically or have their worldview threatened emotionally. And so anything about any anything where the stakes are like dying is basically going to do better than if the stakes were something else like that's uh, that so it's like that's one way to raise the stakes so you look at the martian dying you look at the hunger games dying you know like there's (laughs) there's this threat of death like that's important you look at twilight threat of death and so that's like just the like a very basic way to raise your stakes but that that stuff like i think it really matters and whether you sell or not what I what I think I like about your approach is you have a very strategic analytical approach to the business of writing and publishing, but you also have that same analytical approach to the craft. Yeah, because it, it they kind of seem to work in harmony. Have you always uh, operated that way? Uh, I don't. So no, because <laughs> I didn't understand that for a long time. Hence the books that you know still mediocrely. Um, yeah, no, I, I've. I definitely, uh, I definitely like to look at things from a strategic perspective like that. And um, I've done a lot of story breakdowns of the best, especially of the bestseller lists. 
um, for the, you know, the past 20 years or so, like what, what really made these the bestseller? And when you look, there's, a, it's a lot of the same stuff. It's like, um, I also have a background in like copywriting. So that also helps to see that, like, 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 for example, um, I think it's Jennifer Wynn Barnes, who has done some research oh on this. Oh God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she, she's basically talking about, so you're, you're familiar with her work. She's basically talking about psychological triggers. Um, but yeah, she talks about how like um, death and like love, like these, these like really intense emotions, like winning um, games. Like she, she talks about this and you look at the bestsellers and like, literally they're all, they're like stuffed with those things. Right. Um, so it's not just that's, that's, you know, a lot of people try to stuff their books with tropes at this very sub niche level. And it's like, look at the tropes at the very high level as well. So I think that's kind of missing from some indie authors perspectives is like, you should, like, even though you don't have the resources to make your book, you know, a, a world it, worldwide international number one bestseller um, on your own. Like you, you're probably not going to be able to do that. You can still write like you're write like you have a chance at that, basically, even without that traditional publishing contract. Wow. How do you decide when you're dividing your time up between the work that you do, helping authors understand and be successful, and the storytelling <laughs> the, the, yeah. the the actual writing uh, aspect of it yeah I mean I think so the past couple of years I've not been as active really in either um, just because I I've just been I like I got a little, little burned out in your life. yeah and then I was like <laughs> yeah and then I you know I got pregnant so that was it was a bit of a surprise um for us uh I, I hadn't totally been expecting that um so yeah that that kind of slowed me down but I would say before that it was probably like 30 70 um though sometimes for some years it was like 70 30 um in terms of like writing fiction versus writing nonfiction. okay so yeah I, I really like doing both and I actually I also have a a different nonfiction pen name in spirituality as well. So oh, that yeah. we that most indie authors wouldn't know about because yeah. we're not your target audience, right? Right, not target okay. audience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not necessarily. There is always overlap, <laughs> but, but, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. So um, obviously, uh, getting pregnant, having uh, taking care of a little person. I mean, that's obviously very, very all consuming. <laughs> Does that mean that you've slowly eased back into it or, or, I mean, and then of course, as you're ready to ease back into it, then the, the world completely changes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I, I, um, well, I definitely took some time to adjust to, um, having a child and really being the primary caregiver for my child. Um, and then being the primary caregiver during a global pandemic for my child who's yeah. like six months old, you know, um, and like being with him 24 seven and trying to like still work and like keep, keep everybody happy. Um, yeah, it has, it's definitely taken a while to ease back into it. So I've, I haven't been as active with, um, you know, the Monica Leonelle products. Um, but I have been working on my non my other nonfiction pen name um written two books under that this year and recorded like 79 podcast episodes my my first podcast that i'd ever done so it wow. was it was a lot um but yeah, yeah so put that I'm, on during the pandemic year with a with a like a one-year-old the baby yeah i was recording at like 11 p.m every night <laughs> or not not every night but you know overnight yeah sleep, so. sleep you'll, get, you'll catch up on that later yeah. right <laughs> we didn't really need sleep <laughs> <laughs> do you uh do you work uh every day no i i can't um so that that has been you know i've had to slow down um but i i used to be like kind of a productivity workhorse so it's actually been good um i've really you know having kids i've really learned to do a lot more in a lot less time and okay. I think I used to work like 12 hour days and now I can get almost the whole 12 hour day accomplished in like three to four hours that I have because now is that is that from that productivity is that part of that that you know um yeah doing that work that you're helping others with 
Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I've always been really interested in productivity hacks, and I, and I think they work really well. Um, I, I also think that they work for almost everyone, like, that's a, <laughs> like, sometimes people are like, but I'm really different and special, and I'm like, well, yeah, but, but there's probably something in the productivity world that works for you, like, um, cause I think, I think like if we think our problems are too unique, then we don't seek solutions for them. Uh, so it's like, there's probably something for you in productivity, even if you're not like, um, as like energetic as other people, or, or even if you have other priorities, cause like, like right now, like my family is my number one priority, but I'm right, still, right. still finding ways to be productive, even without being a workaholic, which is sometimes the archetype for the productivity people <laughs> so i have to ask because you were uh the the two books that you did this year were nonfiction books uh on a different topic was that something easier to write at this date and, like at this time in our in our world than a fictional world or even then um you know business and craft of writing yeah, um, so I've, I've also, I have put out a couple of business books and that I'll have a couple more out this year. Some of them are reissues, some of them are new. Um, it, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't specifically, so maybe, yeah, it might have been. Um, the, the main reason I haven't done fiction is just because I, like, nonfiction was just easier for me. Um, so yeah, you might, you might be right. I hadn't really thought of it that way. But yeah, nonfiction tends to be easier for me. And it's like, like the books just like really nicely come together um, pretty quickly. And they're also lower word counts. So that can help uh, as, you know, instead of like an 80,000 word book, I can do like a 30 to 50,000 word book. And it, it still right. is good because it's, uh, that's how nonfiction works. And, and I think uh, there's a lot of traditionally published nonfiction books that are padded to be 70, 60, 70,000 yeah. words. And you're thinking, no, it only <laughs> needed to be 30. <laughs> like, yeah. what, what were you thinking? <laughs> oh, we were thinking we had to fill a certain spot, right? right? Yeah, definitely. So what, uh, you've been in the industry for a long time. What are some of the things that you've been tracking in the industry that, that you're kind of looking forward to? Yeah. Um, so this is, that is an interesting question. I don't know that there's anything specific. I'm so definitely, um, fiction writing apps. I've definitely been looking at those okay. lots of, um, lots of romance authors starting to get queries about that. Um, and specifically about selling their gaming licenses to, um, some of these, uh, companies that are creating fi interactive fiction stories or are doing um, kind of like a serialized storytelling thing but because they are apps on the store they're they're asking for that gaming license so that that's something that is pretty interesting uh, I don't know that a lot of people outside the romance community are even really aware of this at the time or at right. this time because it is mostly romance authors still who are getting contacted. Um, and you're but, talking about those. It, this is kind of like for binge reading, where maybe it's a chapter at a time, and they, yeah. and they acquire coins and they redeem yeah. the coins to get your next yeah. chapter. That, that so, kind of thing. yeah, like uh, Radish Dream Wattpad um, Ink It some of the larger names, but there's also some, there's, so there's those, so that's like the serialized um, apps, but then there's also um, like interactive story apps. And then there's also another style, which is called like chat apps. So the story is written more like a chat. Yeah. Um, the interactive story one is like, they're just, they're just going to um, get your get the rights from you or like you, you sell your subsidiary, you know, whatever specific subsidiary right to them and they will develop a interactive story around that. Um, and so these love stories are actually, they're, they're gaining a ton of popularity in the, uh, I guess the Apple store and uh, Google play store. So uh -huh. yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Are these, uh, I don't know if you've looked at them or not, are, are the contracts that, um, writers are being offered or the deals are being offered are they are they comparable or similar to um what a traditional publisher might be like is it like a rights grab where they want all yeah. the money 
yeah, some of them are definitely rights grabs. So yeah, we <laughs> there's a there's a group actually that uh, my friend Amber Casey started. It's I, I'm not sure. I think it's called like writing on fiction apps or or like authors authors on fiction apps or something like that. Right. Um, but there there's a couple. You know, it's a very small group right now. But I think it's. Um, you know, it's kind of in the same vein as Why for the Win, which is another amazing Facebook group that I love. Um, but it's really people are kind of trying to figure that out still. Like what exactly are, you know, what exactly are the contracts? Because some I think some people kind of jumped in and were like just publishing their novels. And then it's like, oh, wait, like these contracts are not not good. It is a rice grab. The other thing is some of these companies are in other countries, so they're international. So I know there are a couple from China, for example, where um, you really, you need to read the contracts and like look at it, uh, but it's in other languages. So there, there's a lot to, um, a lot to think about there and a lot to learn. And I think authors are just starting to come together to try to um, parse all of that out. Wow. That, that it's fascinating and I know there's way more opportunities for for us to make an income as storytellers not necessarily a single product that we sell right. the way that we think of selling a book um the other thing that I know that you're engaged in and involved in is again other revenue sources for your work for licensing your IP to people who want to acquire it is direct selling uh and so you've done uh, a lot of that as well. What, how are you, how are you doing that selling? Is it off your website mostly or? Yeah. Yeah. It is off my website and I have the advantage again, cause in nonfiction that, that is the only way you sell, like you sell off your website. Um, if you're selling a course or whatever, uh, you do have to deal with taxes like that. Um, you do have to deal with sales tax if you have a nexus in the United States. Um, so the, so for me, there was not a lot of fear um, where I think for some some people in the industry, like you're used to the retailer paying taxes for you. So you're like, I don't want to get into that. Right. Um, but the taxes are not like the setup and the taxes are not that hard. I actually was able to set up my e-commerce store for fiction in less than a week. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So it's, it's really not that bad. Um, and then with taxes, it's really... I think, I think a lot of people don't know this, so that's why I want to share it, but you have to have a nexus in a place in order to have to pay sales tax there. And you cannot collect sales tax until you have a nexus there. Um, and a nexus means that you are doing significant business. You have a significant business presence. In a geographic area. location. Right. Okay. So like, like Australia, for example, you establish a nexus in Australia when you have a sale from Australia. So you, like, you don't have a nexus, unless you live in Australia, but like me being in the US, I can't have a nexus in Australia until I am selling in Australia. And then, um, and then for each place you, you know, some of them have um, sales minimums. So here in the US specifically, in most states, the sales minimum is like $85,000. Right. So in order for me to have a nexus in California and start collecting sales tax, it would be, you know, whatever, 85,000, 100,000, whatever it is okay. for California. Yeah. So, so taxes are not as scary as people think. But it's something to be aware of because when you're yeah. at a certain point, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax and then remitting it to the government. Right. Um, but once you hit a certain point, they're probably going to come, <laughs> they're going to come find yeah. you because it's, yeah, a absolutely. Thing, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the nexus is based on, on each state or each country's yeah. specific, um, cap yeah. or, or, or okay yeah yeah and you know when you make a sale there that's you look up their laws and you figure and it see, out and see if you're within yeah. the the, re the range yeah so what yeah, how exactly. are you how are you how are you handling that? like i'm just curious about the software you're using for sure. the commerce as well as the the delivery of the products yeah so there you know again like two or three years ago we didn't really have these options but um uh, WordPress is a free, it says wordpress.org. It's a free blogging software, basically, though it's become much more than that. It's really, I mean, they, they call themselves content management software. Right. They kind of started more in the blogging world. Um, so that is free and you can, you, you can set that up. Um, and then you can also set up another free plugin called WooCommerce. Um, so, 
So that that's my basic setup. I, I have been on WordPress for years. You can also do it through, um, there's another company called, I think it's Square, yep. Square site, yeah. Square. Uh, yeah, Square, okay. Yeah, and they also have an e-commerce thing. So it's just an add-on that you get to set up your store. Um, and then uh, what else? Oh, how, how am I delivering? Um, Book funnel. Book funnel is a great way to deliver. They do, you know, you can, they, they have expanded their services um, from doing just like arcs. And now you can actually sell eBooks um, with their help. So they, they do the delivery portion. They don't collect the money. They do the delivery portion. Right. Um, and it's, I, I've tried it. It's pretty much flawless. Um, same with audiobooks. Uh, they just opened that up and you can, I think you may have to still join their beta if you want to be a part of that, but you can sell audiobooks from your website now, which is really nice. So, and then print you, you can do that as well. I think, you know, you, you would, you would, um, you would have to order your books or have like basically a, I mean, you can call the warehouse really. It's probably just like your garage or something when you, <laughs> to start out with, or like yeah. a box next to your desk to start out with. But, um, the cool thing, in my opinion, about all that is you can sell directly on your site and you could sell an ebook, a print book, and an audio book as a bundle. So I think bundling is the most valuable thing you can do um, through your own site. Oh, cool. And then maybe it's kind of like, and for this extra package, if you buy today, you get an hour of consultation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can get some coaching. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That is fantastic. So, um, What's one thing that you would want to have gone back, uh, back to 2009, that ancient history in terms of digital publishing, uh, to tell uh, young Monica when she was first checking out that first book that she wanted to get out there? Yeah, that's tough. Um, I, I think like, I mean, I think the, the good thing for me is like, I have made a ton of mistakes in the author business, you know, and, and I think it's okay. Like the, the most important thing for me is that I, I'm still here and I keep trying like that truthfully. Um, I think if you want to be an author, you just persist at it and you just keep going. Uh, and, you know, I think like anybody who's been in this business, the business has changed a lot. Um, and in many good ways, really. Uh, and like, you just keep, keep on going like, like if this is what you want to do so I think I do think people um people give up um truthfully like I like I had said earlier that a lot of the people who were around in 2009 are gone a lot of the people who were around in 2013 are gone like a lot of the biggest names from 2015 not even in the industry anymore um and and so you wonder like what happened did they did they give up? Did they have to give up? Did they really not, were they really not in it to begin with? Were they just in it for a quick buck? Like, um, so, so, you know, a lot of people worry about like, oh, it's just getting more competitive. And I'm like, you know what? The, the tools are getting a million times better. The opportunities are getting a million times better. And a lot of people quit. Like, that's just the reality. Like, just, just like keep going and you, like eventually you're going to have the big catalog and nobody can catch up to you. Like, awesome. <laughs> Very inspiring <laughs> words. I yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Monica, where can people find out more about all the great things that you can offer for authors? I am at the world needs your book.com. Um, and I'm doing, uh, I'm doing a live training series coming up. Um, it's so you can, find out about it on the world com slash events. Um, that's where it's going to be. The page, page is not up yet. So at the time it's recording, but hopefully by the time it publishes, the page will be up. Um, but it's, it's going to be for, um, for like kind of like a deeper dive into some of the retailers, some of the major retailers. So, you know, Amazon will be one of them, but also Kobo, which obviously, you know, a ton about too. Um, so Kobo, Google play, um, Apple Books, uh, Barnes and Noble, and then also just your own website. Um, and just, it's just gonna be like a deep dive into like, um, you know, what those companies are about, how to treat them differently. Cause I think, I think one of the things that I've done in the past and that other, like I see a lot of people doing is kind of like 
going wide and doing like a spray and pray of your books. <laughs> like you're just like uploading them everywhere when each retailer has a really different personality and really um, desires different things from you. And like, uh, and you know that this is, you know, this is probably best, better than anybody, but like every retailer, you want to like invest time into growing your readership just on that specific retailer. So I think people don't really do that right now. So it's, um, it's, it's just, and, and the wide for the win group has really helped with the education of that. But, um, I think there's definitely like more to do. And of course your work, like I, I have said like a couple of times, um, killing it on Kobo was really, really helpful for Kobo. Uh, anybody who's publishing on Kobo, it's a great book. Um, that I love. I, I read it and I brought it to my mastermind and we all, we, we had a whole conversation, you know, whole day that we focused on that book. So. Oh, thank you. That's, I appreciate that. That's very yeah. kind of you to say. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you'll send me a link to, to this uh, sure. course uh, as well. So I can include it in yeah. the show notes, probably sign up for it myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. Sure. Uh, and I know this is kind of off topic for writers, but I have to ask this question because of my passion for telling ghost stories. But, <laughs> but I hear you have some sort of ghost story to share. Yeah, I, well, it's not a ghost. I don't know if it's a ghost story. I live in a really old house, though. It's um, 1898. It was uh, so a bunch of the previous owners did a lot of research on it before we bought it. Um, but it, it's been through a lot. So there's been a couple um, deaths, unfortunately. It's actually been a murder as well, um, which is, it's horrible. It happened a long time ago, thankfully. Um, not, and it wasn't inside the house. It was outside the house, but it, I, it is really, it was really sad. Um, but then also it was a monastery for a while. It wow. was an office for Alcoholics Anonymous for a while. Like it's, it's just been a very, wow. very weird house. Um, and there's just been a lot, a lot that happened. And so, uh, there's also a, so there's also a secret passage in the house. Um, and it basically goes from the third floor um, it's in my husband's office and it goes down to the second floor bathroom. Um, so I don't know, I don't know why it's there, but, uh, it, servants, uh, yeah. Or yeah, I don't know. It could have been, um, it's not the laundry chute. I can tell you that because yeah. the laundry chute is like a different, it's a, um, wow. separate area that they, you know, it like actually went down, um, for, you know, three floors as well, all the way right, to the basement. Right. So yeah, it's just, just really interesting. Has um, that made it into any of your fiction? Not, not yet, but <laughs> it could. It could. Awesome. Monica, thanks so much for hanging out with me here today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's always interesting to talk to somebody who's been uh, in the indie author space from the, you know, the early ancient prehistoric days of the uh, early aughts. And, and, and I, I wanted to reflect on something that Monica said about uh, towards the end of the interview when she talked about staying power. And, and yeah, she talks about these powerhouses, these, these uh, voices who were, were, were killing it in ebook publishing and in the author space. And then, disappeared and uh, I mean uh, some moved on to different things but uh, some just seem to have completely and it's not that they're not engaged in the author community anymore it's just not writing not not releasing not publishing and uh, and so as much as the competition grows um, there's always going to be people who come and go from the publishing industry and then one of the most consistent, Things. She says persistence. I, I like that because it's one of the seven P's of publishing success, in, in, in my opinion. But uh, she does talk about that persistence and it's sticking it out and it's constantly learning because she does reflect on that and she's always learning and teaching. Um, speaking of teaching, uh, there will be a link in starkreflections.ca to uh, some of the courses that she's doing, uh, the live uh, chat sessions that you can uh, register for on her website. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. But I'm always really impressed with authors like Monica who, you know, manage, she manages multiple streams. She manages multiple, even like a, an additional uh, pseudonym and, uh, and obviously different audiences that she caters to, but that she persists and continues to learn 
and continues to stick it out for the long run and adapts to those changes in the industry. Uh, very, very important. Can't emphasize enough how critical that is for for success because it's usually a long-term play. There are people who uh, get lucky early and quickly, but for most of us, it's a long-term thing. And that's something to reflect on, Partic- particularly as we're reflecting towards the end of 2020, a very challenging year for so many people. But, you know, what was it um, in terms of your priorities? That was another thing she spoke about, the priorities with family. Wow, I'm coming on all the P's that uh, were <laughs> reflecting based on what Monica said. But in any case, those are just some of my reflections. That's the end of this episode of Stark Reflections podcast. If you want to help me out, uh, you can share this podcast with a friend that you think would find value in these Stark Reflections on writing and publishing. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.